Ecstasy does have a roadmap. Cinnamon, I don't know what they're doing. I, I, I'm, I'm really not sure what's happening on their side with getting Wayland support. And then there's all of the like little window managers as well that, you know, whilst there are some crazy devs out there, like single devs who are writing massive Wailing positives themselves, a lot of people just don't have the the time to actually build something like this. So this idea of, you know, whilst having the window manager and compositor being the same thing is is good for these big projects and it makes it very easy to adapt things that just couldn't have been done on XORG where everyone's using that same base. It also does have that drawback where it kind of does raise the barrier to entry for some of these, these smaller projects. Yes, I agree with you. Um, I think one of the big solutions for this challenge is going to be WL Roots. Mm. You've probably heard about this. Maybe David even talked about this recently. Um, I think you're absolutely right to articulate this challenge here because the small projects are going to need to do a lot of a lot more work than they're accustomed to doing. Um, but to a certain extent, the writing has been on the wall for a long time. Uh, one of the reasons why I chose KDE when I decided to move into the Linux world was because I felt fairly cognizant of the danger of relying on a project that sits on top of other projects. Mm -hmm. because you end up beholden to the technical and social decisions that they've made. And so when we look at something like Cinnamon, for example, you know, Cinnamon is basically built on a whole bunch of forked GNOME technologies. Mm -hmm. And so their relationship with the GNOME people is not amazing. They use their stuff, but they don't really contribute back to it too much. They have a different architectural vision. They have a different UX vision and all that's fine, right? But it's a risk because they risk having their development roadmap being affected by choices outside of their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is, it is a big challenge and a big risk for them, you know, and a lot of these projects that have existed as soft or hard forks of somebody else's work are going to need to either find the resources to adapt, or they're going to need to get a lot better at justifying their need to exist at all. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat this. It's a bad situation. If you don't have a Wayland roadmap and you're relying on a project that's moving to Wayland, you got to get on that boat or else you're going to fall off the boat and drown. And then all the people who are riding on top of you are going to drown too. Mm -hmm. Maybe that metaphor is a little bit too severe, but that's technologically what's going to happen. I mean, you can't keep your head in the sand when it comes to this stuff. So either maybe rebase on something else, find the manpower, contribute to WL Roots, find a way to collaborate with other projects and make some kind of a shared compositor, but doing nothing is not gonna be an option really. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I agree with you, it's gonna be tough for them. Um, but at this point, nobody can say they didn't see it coming, right? Mm -hmm. Whilst you were mentioning all that, I had that, I'm sure you've seen it before, the XKCD of uh, all modern digital infrastructure, where it's just this, like, giant tower of nonsense and yes. this little, tiny little piece made by some dude in Nebraska who's been maintaining yep. it since 2003. Yeah. Yep. It's so true. It really is. They're like, I... The, when it comes to these window managers, I know that Qtile has a... They've got a Wayland compositor right now. Xmonad are looking to do something, but... And then, obviously, i3 and Sway are, like, one and the same. Um, but for the others, I think a lot of them are just going to be left behind. I... Yeah. I don't know. Like, I would... It, it, it's tough, because I, I like a lot of these projects, but, like... Yeah. Yeah, your impression matches mine, you know, and I think this sort of gets back to what I said before that projects need to justify their existence. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to fork a project, make a couple changes and say, boom, I have a new project, right? And then your project adapts and it grows and it moves in a different direction. But ultimately, we, we live in a very small corner of the world here. You and I are talking when we've got our social groups and we've got our friends, but then when we go out to our non-tech friends, nobody knows what the heck we do, right? So when you're talking about like tiling window managers, you're looking at a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of 
computer users. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at such a small project, resources are correspondingly going to be small too. And I think if you have a project like this, if you run one or if you use one, it's going to be really important to find those resources, to join with another project, maybe to accept that you'll need to move to another project that's 97% the same, but maybe has 3% difference. Maybe you can learn to accept that 3% difference. You can pool your development resources, have twice as much manpower, and then the project can survive mm -hmm. instead of two projects dying in obscurity, right? This is hard, we're nerds. We like talking about code. We don't like collaborating about stuff, but that's gonna be really important, frankly, because small projects with small resources they've always been on thin ice, frankly, you know, and I think we, we can't tiptoe around that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of developers understand this and they're wary about it, but I think when it comes to the users, there are, there are a lot of users, I don't know what the best term for it would be, entitled? Yeah, we'll go with that one. There is a lot of users out there who feel like they are sort of entitled to something working like this is what i've always been using you know you've probably seen this in bug trackers for kde where people oh, feel yes. like you know why is this not working this should be working and it's just like that's great <laughs> but like most of the people like you've got a job doing stuff like involved in kde but i'm sure most of the people on the project are not employed by anyone right. you know to do KDE work. Like they are just doing mm -hmm. this as volunteer work. They are improving things because they are using the project themselves and they want it to improve. And sometimes things are going to sort of be left around for a while and not get dealt with. And that's not because yeah. no one cares about the problem. It's because right now it's not affecting any of the developers and other things are more important to them. It, and, yeah. and, and that's not to say that, you know, you, like, because I, I know a lot of people don't like to hear, like, oh, you just go and open the merge request yourself and fix it. Like, because there are a lot of people out there that just don't have the, no, like, the programming knowledge to fix a problem. Most themselves. people don't, right? Yeah. But if you don't have the knowledge yourself, you have to just accept that you're at the whims of the developers. They will get to the problem when they get to the problem. And... It's sort of yeah. constantly pinging a bug tracker whilst it might show that people want it may not get the problem fixed any quicker. No, it's, it's in fact, it's going to be counterproductive because it's going to annoy developers who will silence their email for that thread. You know, it's, what you're talking about is totally a, a real issue. And it's always very tempting when you see one of those to fire off a snarky reply that says, you know, well, feel free to apply for a, a refund for all the money you paid for the software, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Um, but that doesn't help. Um, I think part of the problem here is that we often do a very bad job of communicating just how resource strapped these projects are. People often come from the proprietary world. And even if, even if they're not explicitly thinking it, there's an implicit assumption that there must be a big team behind this, right? Mm -hmm. There must be some resources. How does this project exist and it's free? Well, I don't know, but so amazing that somebody must be funding it, right? Well, maybe it is just that guy in Nebraska, but how do you know, right? When you go to your package manager and you download a package and maybe you're in even amazing and you read the description of the package before you download it, you're already in the 1% if you do that, right? But the description, no, I read every single does line the description of code. tell you like the warranty? No. Does the description tell you how many users this project has? No. Does the description tell you how many developers it has? No. Does it tell you where the funding sources are? No. Does it tell you what level of support resources exist? Like you can forgive people for not knowing this stuff, right? It's, we don't make it very obvious. Um, and so I think improving that communication is really a very important part of telling this story, helping people to understand just how amazing it is that all this software is free and free means we don't have a team of 30 paid developers working on it, right? Um, just a, a couple of weeks ago, I got somebody on my, my blog who left a comment. He said, you know, I was talking about finances um, in KDE EV, the foundation behind KDE, because I'm a, a 
member of the board of, of this foundation. And somebody said, something suspicious is going on. I'm not surprised that you got in trouble with the German tax authorities because it looks like you're embezzling funds. And you know, I talked with him a little bit and I said, well, why do you think that, right? And he said, well, I looked up your financial information and it looks like you're reporting that KDE's revenue was only 284,000 euros a year. That's so low. That's only enough for like two full-time developers. How could that possibly be KDE? This must be a fake number and you're just concealing the real number and it's all a big money laundering operation. Like this person could not conceive of the notion that the nonprofit foundation behind KDE only takes in 284,000 euros a year. Mm -hmm. Like, so I very gently explained Yes, that's the foundation. Most people are volunteers. Most full-time developers work elsewhere. In fact, we do have employees. They're part-time. They're not like getting rich off of this. Like there's not a lot of money in this. So if, if the number seems crazily low, please see the actionable path as donating because that's where the money comes from, right? Mm -hmm. There's no support contracts. There's no EULAs. There's no, no point of sale system where you buy a CD and, take it home. There's no download. There's no DRM. Anyway. 